rebuilding after a nuclear war. There's a critical question here, which is, is planning for a post-nuclear war construction worthwhile? Is it feasible? Is it unthinkable? So we can think of a case of local catastrophe. Because of the rapid decay of radiation as a deterrent to reconstruction in the absence of a total societal collapse, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were rebuilt relatively quickly. There was a rumor begun by a U.S. science writer after the attacks that Hiroshima and Nagasaki would be uninhabitable for 70 to 75 years because of genetic damage. Now, of course, no genetic damage has been recorded in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Hiroshima and Nagasaki followed the same pattern of reconstruction. There was a temporary relocation to rural areas by the population, and many of the population had already been evacuated in several waves during the war. Land ownership was a major incentive to rebuild and remain in the city. People went back to where their houses used to be. Most foundations and infrastructure, including sewage and electricity, could be salvaged. Hiroshima's pre-attack evacuations had reduced its population from 380 down to 245,000 after five and a half evacuation programs. After the attack, 47 of the 50 hospitals in Hiroshima were rendered unusable and 90% of the 200 doctors there were casualties. Electricity was available in parts of the city within 24 hours. Railroad service resumed 48 hours after the attack in Hiroshima. Telephone service was back in seven days. On the right, you can see a picture of a Liverpool port that was a part of a research project in the UK to assess the damage nuclear weapons would have on a port facility. Actually, ports are fairly simple cement constructions next to deep water, and nuclear weapons would damage some of the infrastructure, like some of the cranes, but ports are fairly impervious to nuclear attack. Nuclear weapons do not dig well. So you'd have to drill a hole and drop a nuclear weapon underneath the port, and then you could detonate it to create a crater. But detonating a bomb next to a port, most ports, would not knock it out. It would certainly require you to bring in new cranes and new infrastructure like trucks. Uh, so it shows you the limitation of the infrastructural damage that's, that's inflicted by nuclear weapons. This map shows the refugee movements out of Hiroshima. And you can see where the relief groups approach from the outside. Uh, and if you remember the other slide we had on the fallout, I, I guess it's fortuitous that the Hiroshima population fled towards the northeast and the fallout, uh, the, the little of it that there was, landed uh, to the uh, northwest. Uh, here you can see a rather exaggerated description of survivors escaping uh, out of a nuked Chicago with, let's see, some of them are blind, which, which as we know, uh, there's only one case of blindness from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There's a lot of sick, dying, burns, uh, insane. Um, again, this goes to 19th century predictions that uh, uh, strategic bombing causes people to go um, uh, somewhat socially dislocated, and, and there's very little evidence of that. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder, doesn't necessarily translate into manic uh, behavior. On the right, you can see a, um, uh, an individual responsible um, for civil defense in Canada. Uh, um, he was General Worthington. He was also the uh, Canadian general who founded the Armored Corps leading up to World War II. And here you can see a papier mache mushroom cloud on, if you look very carefully, it's on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. So uh, this was a civil defense drill exploring what Canada could do to, it, to respond to a nuclear attack on several cities. So this is a picture of Hiroshima in mid-1949. And the population by this time had returned uh, to its pre-attack level. The key here is the infrastructure. You can see the tramway is running uh, down the main street and the road has been cleared. And there's a link up obviously between the parts to the north that were unaffected and the parts to the south that were unaffected through this uh, debris field. This is uh, Hiroshima rebuilt uh, 10 years later in 1955 and you can see um, uh, more large buildings. You still have some of the wooden buildings in the rear uh, 
but uh, building codes spread the city out. It reduced reduced its density, and so in some respects, the new Hiroshima would have been more resistant and probably had uh, fewer casualties um, uh, because of the uh, stronger construction of the homes. Now here you can see a chart about the location of the populations, and, and here you have the, the basically the inhabitants per uh, square kilometer. Um, although it doesn't actually give you the density on the left side, it's sort of notional uh, increase, uh, and I think it's about a, you can interpret it as sort of a hundred percent from zero to a hundred percent. So there were 142,700 people in Nagasaki by November 1st, 1945. Um, and this is after the attack on Nagasaki. Nagasaki recovered its nighttime population by 1960, so it eventually recovered, but it's all, also be qualified that in the 50s and 60s, uh, Japan went into a large-scale uh, train construction program, so a lot of people left the center cities, which were high density, uh, and moved out into the equivalent of suburbs, not, not houses, but apartments, connected close to the rail line. So on November 1st, 1945, uh, three months later, Hiroshima's population was 137,000, and by mid-1949, its population was up to its pre-attack level, and 70% of the homes had been rebuilt. And again, um, it, it, it's, uh, it's an issue because most people returned, but some didn't. The, the railways extended the size of the city into the suburbs. So you can see in this uh, image, the population increase and then uh, decrease before the attack because of evacuations and then uh, its rapid increase uh, shortly thereafter so in just a few years. So there's a, a reconstruction of the city. Here again you can see uh, uh, with Nagasaki and Hiroshima laid over each other almost identical outcomes. A rapid increase of returning uh, people and then it slowed down gradually. Now, conventionally bombed out cities like Dresden and Hamburg in uh, Germany in World War II had similar recovery stories. Cities tend not to be rebuilt when they have completely lost their populations. Now, in the case of Hamburg and Dresden, th there was a heavy loss of life. Uh, both cases were uh, firebombing. 100,000 people died in several consecutive days of magnesium bombing, which caused the uh, Elbe River to, to boil away so you could walk from one side of the city to the other. But one of the uh, strong incentives to rebuild the city was not, not the uh, engineers or the, or the urban planners. Uh, it was the lawyers. Uh, people owned a piece of property and even if the house was completely demolished, uh, it was their right to own that property. And so if they had uh, uh, some claim to the deed, they went back after the city had been bombed and said, um, this is my land. So. Uh, private property uh, has not an insignificant effect on getting people to move back to an area even if it's been destroyed by a nuclear weapon. Now the near total destruction of the population um, does lead uh, to uh, permanent um, desolation and there are plenty of cities in the world that um, are completely abandoned. I think of for example the uh, capital of old Armenia, Ani, which was uh, sacked by the uh, Seljuk Turks under Alp Arslan. And that city's there today. It's, uh, it's got many old big ruins. You can Google it, A-N-I. One among a thousand cities in the world, particularly in the uh, Near East, that have been abandoned over the ages because the river changed its course or because strategically the population uh, found a better life uh, elsewhere. So Carthage, Pompeii, uh, Saint-Pierre in Martinique uh, had um, uh, issues with recovery. Uh, Saint-Pierre in Martinique was, was hit by a volcano and um, obliterated and it's, it's never been rebuilt. It's got a very small population there now. Um, 30,000 people were killed and in 2000 it still only had 6,000 people. So the human element is very important as an agent of construction. Here you can see Japanese soldiers rummaging for building materials in Nagasaki. This is a map of the uh, Great Chicago Fire of 1871. It killed uh, 250 to 300 people. It rendered 100,000 people homeless. But the city was uh, pretty quickly uh, rebuilt. This is a uh, depiction of the San Francisco earthquake in April 18, 1906. It killed 450 to 700 people, 
rendered a quarter of a million people homeless. And here you can see the uh, San Francisco earthquake survivors uh, going through the city. So we could also think of a generalized catastrophe. These are large uh, scale catastrophes, much bigger than uh, what we just examined. Hiroshima and Nagasaki could be rebuilt quickly because not all of Japan had been similarly destroyed. There are cases of large scale collapse where the rate of reserves, which are the goods you have, is consumed faster than the rate of reinvestment, which is basically the modern equivalent for this would be the surviving stocks of machinery, the breaking down faster than reinforcements or parts could be obtained to fix these machines. And then this then leads to a downward spiral. And the, the, the drop of education and the uh, loss of population due to plagues and the disorder caused by um, violent migrations um, uh, for several centuries undermined the uh, economic strength of a lot of the post-Roman um, uh, uh, communities, particularly in uh, England, uh, Spain, um, and you can see you can see the severe uh, the, the severe impact of a combination of disasters that cause a loss of administrative capacity. So this this downward spiral occurred during the Black Death uh, between 1348 and uh, 1350, uh, largely uh, because of wars that occurred simultaneously. So you had you know 30 percent of Europe and the Middle East population lost and the initial recovery was very slow. It, now, this is not an isolated event. It occurred at the same time as the Mongol invasions. So uh, many of these, many of these um, uh, uh, losses of life have to do with you know, new exposure to disease, but then are, are compounded by um, large-scale violence that makes it happen. Um, the Irish potato famine of the 1840s reduced Ireland's population from 5 million to 2 million. And um, it's only, uh, uh, I have in my notes, it's, it's, it's not yet recovered, but it's in fact, it's recently covered, recovered. Uh, Ireland's population is slightly more than 4 million. Um, maybe a million people died in that event. Uh, most uh, emigrated to uh, the, uh, North America uh, or to uh, Australia. Now, the Mongol uh, occupation of China, I should say the conquest of China, um, inflicted huge losses. Uh, the Mongol the Mongol attack in the 14th century resulted in an explicitly genocidal policy to reduce the presence of the Chinese in the northern um, plain of, of China, south uh, and around the uh, Yellow River. It resulted in the deaths of 75% of the inhabitants of North China, about 30 million people. Other losses that were on a similar scale were caused by the Manchu in the 18th century when they were occupying China and they killed about 25 million. And of course, you have the Taiping Rebellion, uh, which occurred in the mid-19th century, which killed 20 million, but that, that was not inflicted as much as self-inflicted. Now, um, in, in at least the, uh, the first two cases, the Mongols and the Manchu, there was an attack on the irrigation system, which led to flooding, which led to starvation, which led then to uh, disease. So um, all, of these, all of these outcomes are uh, sequential. Uh, but China in particular is very dependent on an irrigation system because the water comes from um, ice melt in the mountains that comes down the Yellow and the Yangtze and uh, you don't have as much controlled rain as you do in uh, Western Europe. Now you can see here uh, demographic fluctuations in Egypt for a variety of reasons, um, but almost always they're a combination of ecological and uh, whether or not the administrative capacity is there for uh, providing counter-cyclical storage of, of grain to deal with expected famines and expected uh, or rather anticipated uh, drops in the level in the Nile, which is vital for bringing um, a fertilized, uh, so a fertilized um, uh, water onto the uh, soil during the floodings. Now at the top, you can see Greece and its population dropped from 2.5 million um, uh, 300 years and 200 years before the Common Era to as low as 800,000 um, uh, in, in um, AD 600 uh, during the uh, migrations of the uh, Slavs. So it's, it's you know, a dramatic changes in populations. The idea that populations are robust isn't, isn't true. Um, uh, so you're looking at a 70% population loss after the, the, the departure of the Romans. Uh, here we have Paraguay, and you can see um, in 1870 uh, a step loss in population. This is because of the Paraguayan War. Paraguay was a mostly mestizo society, which means indigenous and mixed with uh, European immigrants. Uh, 
Um, and they had a, a leader called Lopez who wanted to uh, expand and then provoked a war with Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. Now, uh, Brazil had uh, legalized slavery at the time, and Lopez was reasonably well organized, so the Paraguayans didn't want to surrender as prisoners because then they'd be enslaved. So they fought to the death. And so you're looking at a population uh, 525,000 that was reduced to 221,000 and in fact only 29,000 adult males survived. Only 20% of the adult male population survived. Um, Paraguay nevertheless um, rebuilt. Uh, again with Spain you have a long history we have some way of estimating what their population was. This is a book by uh, Jones who did a very interesting study uh, but you can see drops in population due to the Roman collapse, the Black Death, and uh, deforestation, and uh, um, uh, you know, in recent times the populations exploded enormously. But obviously, a loss of population um, uh, did have strategic effects at certain times in period, uh, certain certain times uh, in history. But you know, odd, oddly enough, the uh, the arrival of the Saracens and the Muslims, um, they're associated with with an increase of population in Spain. Um, which um, indicates that they had um, reasonable administrative skills, probably in the areas of uh, agriculture. And the Saracens were very enthusiastic about water because they came from a place that didn't have it, and so they made sure that uh, irrigation was efficient. So, what are the actions to be done immediately after a nuclear attack? So you're looking at vast devastation. During the 1980s, uh, 700 to 1,000 Soviet warheads were targeted at the United Kingdom alone with a yield of 500 to 700 megatons which if used would have left would have led to 42.5 of the 1971 population of 54 million becoming casualties and uh, those that were lightly injured might survive but those that were um, severely injured were almost certainly going to be dead and if you look at this map it shows you in the black areas the 90 to 100 uh, percent casualty area uh, England is relatively flat and um, you have concentrations of cities around coal fields, and you have London, and you've got mines in southern Wales, and uh, those areas um, have very dense populations, and I, I can't imagine where they could have escaped to. Here's a, a, a closer uh, view. On the left, uh, we have areas that have livestock farming. Uh, they're probably not going to do um, that poorly because you can move your your um, livestock around and the circles show uh, damage at two psi levels so you're gonna be throwing uh, sheep around from the shock waves on the right you can see uh, arable farming and mixed farming and again uh, nuclear weapons are mostly targeted at urban areas so um, probably many many people in the in the rural areas are not even going to be affected if you look at for example uh, cornwall which is the the bottom uh, extreme right um, uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of projection coming out of England, there's not a lot of nuking going on there. So the Cornish people uh, will survive. Now nearly 60% of the US population lives on only 1% of the total land area. Um, and this is a result of the fact that approximately 85% of the, of, of, of the population of large metropolitan areas live on only 10% of the total urban area. So you have a lot of people in apartments. Now obviously that's changed today, even with condos, uh, much larger suburbs. The U.S. in particular is, is, a, is, a, is a country, not of cities, but of towns. In Europe, you do have cities where uh, maybe, maybe a fifth of the country lives in the capital, and or, or, or at least 10%. Um, you know, cities like Tehran, uh, Moscow, London. Um, but in the U.S., it's, it's a fairly dispersed population, with the exception perhaps of uh, New York. Um, so in a large-scale attack, destruct, destruction of 44 to 55% of the manufacturing capacity uh, would occur if the 71 largest metropolitan areas were destroyed in the U.S. Now, much of that wealth destroyed will be luxury. You know, manufacturing of video games, sports cars, water skiing equipment, and a lot of industry will no longer be crucial. And so in that type of environment, you're not looking at, um, at, at a government that's going to encourage the setting up of consumer industries. Besides which, most people won't have the surplus capital necessary to buy that stuff. Uh, at the bottom, you can see a pamphlet uh, encouraging uh, Chinese to dig um, bunkers underneath their village to survive, a tried and true uh, method. Mao believed that China would lose less than half its population in a nuclear war and therefore was not worried. And I think that that may not have been wise because 
uh, China's threshold of how many people have to die before the Chinese change their identity is um, uh, much lower than I think Mao thought. China has a very powerful centrifugal force and China spent more time uh, ruled by non-Chinese and uh, uh, basically separated into uh, separate kingdoms than it spent um, united under dynasties. So here you can see a map which shows by percentage uh, of state manufacturing value that would be destroyed by uh, nuclear weapons particularly states like Ohio, which are very industrialized, Michigan, uh, New York, California, uh, Texas would be severely devastated. And of course, you know, places like Montana um, would be spared. So this is from observations from Hiroshima Nagasaki. In the areas of destruction, the only cohesive units will be surviving or portions of surviving nuclear families. Isolated, injured strangers, including orphans, will not receive help by passerbys. They're going to uh, probably die. There will be no spontaneous rescue uh, or relief groups. Survivors will remain in their shelters for two weeks to a month, and this is a period of inactivity in which you'll have um, no economic progress. Here you can see Japanese refugees that took shelter. So, um, you know, we can raise the, the issue, what's, you know, the importance of preparation. Um, there's a big debate as to whether civil defense is actually worthwhile against a nuclear attack. You know, if you tell, if you prepare your population for nuclear war, you could be signaling the opponent that you're getting ready for a nuclear war. And that was the big concern in the U.S., which is why after a scare in the, uh, in the 50s and 60s, where people built a lot of their own bomb shelters, it was eventually scaled back, and the U.S. had a laissez-faire attitude in the 70s, or a sort of an après moi le, dé le déluge type of um, attitude towards nuclear war, where they didn't really think about it. The Soviet Union spent a lot more time, as well as China, with trying to organize their, pro their population to resist nuclear attack, but I think um, the Soviets and the Chinese were even less well prepared. They spent, they primarily spent their time organizing their population to continue to control it after a nuclear war. But after a nuclear war, a lot of the social contracts in place in the Soviet Union would have broken down, probably along ethnic, ethnic lines. And so the Soviet Union wouldn't have saved its population. It, it would have um, basically been trying to avert civil war. Now here you can see a uh, Geiger counter, the Gamma Scout, which you can buy for uh, $299, but it's actually possible to build your own Geiger counter, and you can find out the instructions on the internet on, on how to do that. Now the U.S. highway system was designed for civil defense and nuclear attack. The Americans spent about $60 billion in the 50s building a highway system that was designed to go around the cities so that uh, the debris from a destroyed city wouldn't block the, um, the highway. Uh, in 1961, 200,000 U.S. families built bomb shelters in their home. Now, you can go to your local municipality. Uh, you know, I'm a homeowner and, and investigate building a bomb shelter. And uh, where I live in Point Claire, they said no. The problem is you're not allowed building structures in most municipalities in Canada that involve um, underground structures without windows. So they insist that you have a window, which is, of course, the perfect uh, entry point for a giant shockwave. Um, Lincoln, Nebraska had enough shelters in the mid-1960s for about 100,000 people. So you do occasionally have local government that take charge. I had a student uh, in this course who did a paper on Cornwall's preparations for war. They're along the International Seaway and they have a dam. So they most certainly would have been a target of a Soviet nuclear attack. And there actually was a plan, uh, but it sort of collected dust. And my student went down there and uncovered it and was able to uh, critique it, which is sort of fun. Um, here you can see uh, someone wounded in uh, Nagasaki. So short-term recovery. Well, heavy mortality will certainly reduce pressure on support systems. The first goal would be to establish uh, law and order, and this is typically done through uh, martial law. In 1906, uh, the San Francisco earthquake led to the immediate mobilization of the local state army. The problem in order to counter uh, regionalism and banditry, but it actually uh, turned into a bit of a problem the uh, National Guard were poorly uh, disciplined and they shot a lot of people. And ultimately, um, uh, uh, police forces from outside of San Francisco were brought in to replace them. So uh, soldiers are not always a solution, especially for policing. Um, a, a person with a, with a larger gun isn't going to do a better job at reducing uh, crime necessarily. Uh, Canada estimated um, it would take about 300,000 uh, civilians to administer uh, 
um, uh, the governments, the local governments and the central governments of Canada to rebuild. You might have to institute censorship to counteract uh, demagoguery or um, extremist behavior or, um, God forbid I mention this here, uh, separatism. Uh, you'd need to reestablish communications. Now, the internet was designed in the 1960s um, in its sort of a network setup in order to survive a nuclear war. So the internet is probably going to be fairly easy to, to, to return to operation. Uh, you'd have to reestablish basic services like water, uh, which is a big issue. Montreal's got three concentrated uh, water purification centers in uh, Riviera de Prairie, in uh, Point Claire, a fluorination center, and in LaSalle. Uh, if they lose power, um, electricity, you'd have to restore that somehow with generators. Um, but um, the idea of being able to provide water for the million and a half people that live on the island of Montreal quickly and easily is going to be problematic. But, you know, we live next to the St. Lawrence River. You can always just boil boil your water. Uh, you'd have to, of course, um, ensure a food supply through rationing. Uh, the British actually improved the uh, the average health of their citizen by forcing them to eat healthy food after World War II. And so they kept the rationing system extended longer than was required because uh, it'll, it enabled them to target uh, children. Um, you'd have to, of course, fix the sewage system and infrastructure like bridges. Here you can see a German Rheinbot missile um, that was uh, had a range in 1944 of 200 kilometers and it was a multi-stage uh, missile wasn't used for uh, strategic purposes, it was sort of a, um, a research experiment. Now I mention this because uh, it's remarkable that we've seen this happen again, but the influenza epidemic at the end of the First World War killed about 20 million. Now most of those were killed in India and China, but 16 million of the 20 million were killed in India and China. Um, and it, it actually killed more than those that died in the First World War. Coughing was illegal in public, and this is in an age before penicillin. Penicillin, of course, is a fungus um, that was discovered to um, uh, turn orange peels green. And the, the way it works is that if it goes inside your, um, your blood supply, it then attacks and kills anything with a plant wall on it. And it just so happens, you know, plant walls are different from, from our walls. Our, our, our cell walls are, are flexible. Plant walls are hard. And so bacteria have plant walls. You know, who knew that? So when you eat penicillin, uh, it goes around killing all the things with plant walls inside your body. Um, too much penicillin, of course, is not good for your um, liver. Um, uh, it's not horrible, but you know, if you take it every day, it's going to reduce the functioning of those parts of your body that filter out um, your blood uh, and other parts of your, uh, your circulatory system. Um, but penicillin uh, didn't come around until 1941, and so uh, influenza was, was lethal um, for uh, large numbers of people, especially uh, those coming out of the First World War who had been gassed and their lungs were damaged. And uh, the First World War, uh, in order to control people's nerves, um, the governments uh, freely distributed cigarettes and uh, addiction to smoking uh, more than doubled as a consequence of the First World War. So you had a very ill population and a lot of premature death from a combination of these effects. Um, uh, you have to clean up the debris. About one third of the U.S.'s manufacturing capacity would lie uh, within geographic areas most affected by fallout. So how do you how do you go back to work in a factory covered in radiation? You'd have to rationalize responsibilities between central and local authorities, cut back on some central services and regulations, and increase others like uh, military support. Uh, here you can see a picture from a publication uh, from Canadian uh, Civil Defense, and you can see there are bulldozer clearing uh, debris. Now, in terms of long-term recovery, we have to think of Reconstruction as focused on uh, a rural surviving part of the state, which we could call Country B, and uh, Country A, which is the destroyed urban portion of that state. And it sounds peculiar, but you need managers. You need people who have experience on, on you know, what I would call general contractors or uh, integrated um, uh, industrial engineers who know how to mix things together optimally at the same time. You could certainly have a, a government with different people in charge, but if you missed allocate the resources, you're going to have uh, you're going to be producing too many car engines and not enough tractor tires, and then you end up with a with a uh, sort of a problem up ahead. And there were many inefficiencies uh, observed in command economies in the Second World War in, in places like the U.S. So that would have to be, you know, uh, sort of carefully thought out. You can't simply say, okay, we need managers. You need to figure out how you find those educated people. Uh, this here, obviously, is the the first Canadian Parliament. It, it wasn't, of course, huge. It was burned down. 
um, but this is what it looked like before it was rebuilt into the structure uh, that we have today. So, uh, housing. Well, most housing today is surplus because uh, families are much smaller than they used to be, even uh, just a generation earlier. The, the number of children per family, the total fertility rate is, is, is down. Um, the actual capacity of houses was estimated you know, in the 1970s in the U.S. to be about 200%. Now, immediate evacuation will cause uh, strains. You know, old and new populations will compete for limited resources. The evidence during the bombing in England and Japan in World War II indicates that social and ethnic tensions generally are widened, not reduced. Although the propaganda from England makes it sound like it was a fantastic success, uh, it wasn't. It, it resulted in uh, the requirement for a lot of intervention by police to make it happen. In Japan, uh, petty crime increased with the bombing and um, uh, this was in part due to social collapse near the end of the conflict. Ethnic cleavages often lead to scapegoatism. People blame other people. 6,000 Koreans were attacked and massacred during the 1923 Tokyo earthquake. So there's just large scale widespread violence. Now racial tensions may erupt between unassimilated identity groups in places like the US and they would get guns and shoot at each other. Um, Housing will shift from the suburbs to new industrial concentrations because of the shift from personal to public mass transit. There simply won't be the fuel or individuals won't have the, 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 the capital necessary to buy the fuel to have personal uh, vehicles, at least not initially. Municipalities will evolve uh, as a consequence. So, you know, geography, um, especially urban geography matters. Um, here we have uh, pictures of the fluctuating populations of Hamburg. So you can see uh, it's got a very similar pattern to Hiroshima Nagasaki. You can see um, the population in thousands. So we're looking at you know uh, uh, more than a million people in Hamburg. You can see the pre-attack population, um, and then you can see the the Hamburg attack, which was the uh, firebombing attack, and the uh, significant drop in the population to less than a million. And then um, the population actually returned. Um, in 1943. Uh, you can see the same uh, drop in population uh, related to the um, persons per dwelling numbers uh, and it increased. Uh, people basically moved into each other's houses, relatives moved in with other relatives and uh, life went on because you can you can put quite a few people into a room if you have to. Now this is a, a very interesting uh, chart um, it basically says you can lose houses faster than a population without much effect, but um, once you've lost 70% of your population, you're going to reach a saturation point in which you're going to have a huge loss in the uh, number of people, right? So 70% is sort of this magical number that seems to recur. And you can see this in the chart on the right where you have a percentage change in housing, minus 70%, and that then leads to a big drop off in population. That's, now, that saturation level may change um, because uh, today we have much, uh, because of the, the way that we have transit set up in highways, uh, people live much farther out from the central cities than they did when the study was done, which is the 60s and the 70s, right? Which was the height of looking at what could be done um, from the standpoint of um, civil defense to save, to save people. Right, and you can see it on on the on the uh, left, the percentage change in population, and the percentage change in dwellings. So, um, yeah, these are different examples. So, agriculture, the U.S. has a two to four years uh, worth of uh, food supply. So, agriculture is not an immediate priority, and energy can be invested elsewhere. Um, two hundred days of grain. Uh, well, it was stored when this study was done in the 1970s. And energy can be redirected and invested elsewhere. 200 days of grain, uh, sorry, so the US food system, uh, including production, processing, and distribution is both highly integrated and dispersed. Since food may travel a thousand miles or more from production to consumer, the system depends very heavily on effective transportation and organization. You don't need trucks. Um, you can certainly use trains and trains can use coal and there are technologies for liquefaction that can turn uh, coal into fuel and you can get ethanol, which is a form of engine alcohol, um, from corn and ethanol is already added to car engines. Uh, it, rather, it's ad already added to fuel at the fuel pump in a small percentage, about 10%. Um, engines won't survive long. They'll be severely corroded if they on operate only on ethanol. But uh, all military vehicles can operate off of ethanol for a much longer period than civilian vehicles. 
so you might just simply change the um, uh, you know the the, uh, the 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 standards for building engines, but trains are very efficient, and the train network in most parts of the world today that are developed are it's basically a very very um, a thorough system, and so that's a much more cost-effective way of uh, transporting goods. Now, about one third of the American population lives in counties that produce less than a two-week supply of their grain needs, and half the population lives in counties with two months or less of uh, production capacity. Here you can see the post-detonation uh, refugees in uh, Nagasaki, including um, what looks like a large number of soldiers. Uh, here you can see uh, natural gas pipelines and crude oil pipelines. I thought I would do it from the perspective of uh, the Soviet Union firing rockets at them. So refining capacity. 98% of the petroleum refining capacity in the U.S. would be destroyed. We're talking an overwhelming proportion of it because it's very concentrated in places like uh, Texas. And you do have some minor uh, facilities near where the fracking is occurring uh, in the Midwest. Surviving capacity would be inadequate to meet even farm fuel needs. So foreign petroleum would likely also have been hit by a nuclear strike, which means the Soviets would probably have fired a nuclear weapon at oil fields in Mexico, and Nigeria, Angola, Indonesia, uh, and the uh, British uh, North Sea um, uh, uh, oil pumps. So repair would take many years. Substitution with coal would also take many years. Uh, petroleum was required for heating, uh, fuel, farming, manufacturing, and transportation. Now, even if 85% of U.S. manufacturing capacity survived, without fuel, only as much as 25% of it would be operable in the first two years. Now, the U.S. Navy did have a plan, which was never realized, to have a portable refining capacity that was 10% of the national uh, fixed capacity. Obviously, that was uh, totally unreasonable in a, a free market environment like the U.S. The U.S. was not going to spend that much money on, on a capacity. Here you can see a U.S. Tomahawk missile in the early days. Here you can see the uh, distribution of U.S. refineries, again, concentrated in uh, Texas. Um, here is the survival actions required um, by the different um, people that would be targeted by fallout. Yeah, it says here without fallout shelters, radiation would kill another 46 million people. So you'd, you'd lose double your population, 62 million from blast and heat, and another 46 million from fallout, long-term uh, um, uh, injuries due to radiation. This is the um, U.S. food links, showing the, the movement of food from you know, places uh, you know, in, where you have a lot of um, cattle and farming in the Midwest of the US, places like Iowa. This is uh, the much, in fact, more concentrated refining capacity in the Soviet Union in the late 70s, showing that the Soviet Union was in, in some ways worse off than the US in terms of the concentration of these vital industries. Now manufacturing, bottlenecks. Well, the effect of a shortage on limiting subsequent dependent industries is, is bottlenecking, and it's likely the result of a nuclear attack, and it could hold up full production for years. During World War II, uh, during the bombing campaign in the, uh, uh, against Germany by the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Air Force targeted ball bearings. Now, when you, when you ride your bicycle, um, you don't actually have a wheel on an axle. What you have is a wheel, and inside the wheel uh, are small little balls which are covered in grease, and it's, it's them that allow the frictionless spinning of the wheel around a metal axle. And they're incredibly um, uh, perfectly spherical. If they weren't, then, um, then they would start to, to break apart. Now, I, I've ridden my bicycle pretty aggressively and uh, by flying off of uh, relatively high um, sidewalks at high speed, and I've crunched. I've crunched my ball bearings, and now I can hear my, hear my ball bearings crunch against each other as I bike, and my wheel's starting to wobble. It's eventually going to pop off. Everything that spins uses ball bearings. Um, uh, tanks, airplanes, trains, mach any, any machinery that spins in a factory. So um, there are certain types of um, technologies that, that are required by every machine, but they're only produced in a few places, and if you target those, then everything else uh, is held up. Manufacturing can increase productivity by two to three hundred percent because you have excess capacity. Many factories are closed at night. 
um, the biggest expense for most factories is wages. But if, if you can slash the wages and the government can take over a lot of the consumption issues like providing food through rationing, then you can have more workers than you would have had normally and you could keep your um, workers coming in on multiple shifts. You can reduce uh, sta safety standards. Um, and so a lot of extra workers will shift from the service industry into manufacturing. Incentives for development, a combination of private property with government control and agencies directing growth and resource allocation could work in areas like fuel, manufacturers and primary products. Nevertheless, you, you always have the risk of, of absenteeism if workers have to go somewhere else to get food. So um, reasonable organization does matter. Here you can see uh, workers working on a cruise missile. So the market. Well, authority will have to be defined between central government and local authorities. The local authorities are probably responsible for rationing of food, fuel, uh, price controls, um, re-establishment of credits, and courts, uh, fighting of black markets, including um, the sale of guns, uh, local uh, communications, and of course, education has to continue. Uh, if you if you stop educating your population for a generation, it's it's the equivalent of the collapse of civilization. Over 70% of technical and university education programs will have been destroyed with the urban areas where they are, are located. Here you can see a US A6 intruder dropping a Tomahawk cruise missile, which could be nuclear armed. Um, these aircraft uh, could also drop nuclear bombs from aircraft carriers, which is where they were deployed. I had a student a while back uh, who confronted me uh, because they were from a rural area in eastern townships, uh, south of Montreal, and they told me that, what the hell do we know in Montreal? Uh, living in the rural area, he had horses, he had farming experience, uh, they have mechanical experience because they have equipment they need to, to fix and replace, like tractors, and that stuff is, is uh, very expensive and it's much cheaper to just know how to do it yourself. Um, they had knowledge of you know how to deal with waterways and plant food and you know they're not complete complete hicks. They, they had computers so they could sell their goods online so they're heavily uh, involved in the world economy and moving goods around um, and so you know he actually questioned this and said you know where are the better managers right in the urban areas or elsewhere. So this is a, uh, a conception of a recovery chart if, if you had investment. So if you had only a part of the US destroyed, you could redirect the investment intensively to uh, rebuild other parts of the economy. Now there's always limits. Um, I'll give you a story. Uh, Iran um, got enormous oil wealth after the, um, the oil embargo of 1973. They, they increased their wealth enormously. So the Shah of Iran invested heavily in, of course, building uh, the economy of Iran by primarily focusing on infrastructure and, and uh, sometimes projects didn't go as quickly as he wanted to and so one of the expedients was to take more money and throw it at the problem. Now that's a sort of a simplification but essentially what happened with the Iranian economy was it suffered hyperinflation and it was in part because of you know structural factors to do with competition uh, in oil from elsewhere particularly from the North Sea uh, uh, where the English and the Norwegians were, were pumping out oil, but the other problem was that when you throw money at a problem and you have a fixed amount of infrastructure, which means if you're bringing goods in at a certain rate on railroads and ports and then you, you double the amount of money that's being uh, thrown at the problem, you actually uh, create inflation because you've got twice the money for the same good. And uh, ultimately the inflation led to unemployment, which, which led to a uh, revolution. But it's just a warning that throwing money at a problem, money is a form of paper credit. It indicates you're shifting uh, a promised effort from one place to another, um, but there are actual physical limitations to what you can do, which you need to be aware of that sometimes a command economy is better equipped to deal with than a, a currency-based market economy. Here's uh, the recu recuperation of consumption. Not all of it is completely frivolous, but uh, you've got durables, housing, non-durables, food that sort of leap back. Um, uh, and if you look at the uh, horizontal axis, it's, it's, it's measured in years. Right? Sometimes it takes years to rebuild. Uh, we haven't talked about it in this class, but I've talked about it in another course, my Causes of War class, that uh, we have this idea that uh, World War II unleashed enormous uh, creative potential. The Germans, you know, they put rockets together and uh, the US invented the atomic bomb and the British worked on radar. Uh, and life was completely different at the end of the war. But that's actually a myth. 
Every country in World War II, including the U.S., that participated lost vital years. The Americans built enormous numbers of tanks, but these tanks rusted after the war. They didn't become tractors. The countries that lost, lost up to 25 years of growth. So the counterfactual is if World War II never happened, Americans would have gotten TVs in their living rooms 10 years earlier. So it's not actually true that World War II solved uh, the economic problem of the Depression. In fact, if you look at the drop in unemployment in the U.S. and the rise of the size of the army, basically the unemployed in the 1930s um, uh, were no longer unemployed because they were given a rifle, a helmet, and sent overseas. Would you rather be unemployed collecting um, charity or would you rather be getting shot at? So um, uh, recuperation of, of consumption would happen faster without war. Even though we've got these sharp rises here, uh, it would be even higher if the war never even occurred. Uh, and so these are sort of different scenarios for a U.S. Uh, demographic loss and, and the years it would take to recover. And you know, all of this assumes that the U.S. even maintains its independence, because I think Mexico might want to have a word or two about um, some of its real estate that was seized in 1846 during the Mexican-American War. So there are, of course, consequences of, um, of, of weakness. Uh, continuance of the war will be, uh, will be difficult. You know, disruption of only 10% of the industrial sector will disrupt 30 to 40% uh, of the uh, defense-related industrial sectors. Major, uh, a major assumption is that no one interferes with the reconstruction efforts. Now, this is a little problem for um, the US or UK or Canada. Uh, but for Russia, you know, it's got China looking at it in Siberia and it's got other extended frontiers that it may not be able to reach and provide security for. Plus, countries could be subject to follow-on attacks. You'll have reconnaissance flights or satellites that will be put up and you would then nuke the new industrial concentrations. So it may be um, a chronic nuclear war that goes on forever. Nevertheless, uh, there are diminishing returns. Deploying five times the number of nuclear weapons needed to destroy the 71 metropolitan areas of the U.S. will only increase the damage by 200%. So you just you know you run out of targets. Having more nuclear weapons um, is going to lead to a, a severe uh, diminish diminishment um, in in gains. So something from an earlier uh, something from an earlier. Um, uh, a slide that I want to mention here before uh, we end this, which is that infant and over 65 mortality rates will decrease, or rather will increase dramatically. Uh, there simply won't be the specialized uh, medical care available to deal with premature children, for example. Um, and even with a, with a very large scale nuclear war, it'll be hard to return to a pre-World War I economy. Um, the, main, the main limitations are mechanizing agriculture, and that has to be done on a very large scale and has to be done with the energy resources that enable that to happen. Here we have a, a Chinese Tupelo F-16 Badger being assembled in a factory and we have the French construction of the ballistic missile submarine L'Indomitable. And then I want you to look carefully at the next slide because it's going to be used in class. The uh, pink areas are areas of total devastation. So take a, a minute or so and take a look at this map. 